We know that the main reason that John has been writing to these Christians or these churches is for the assurance of salvation. I highlight the fact, though, the reason he is writing to this church is not because he thinks this church is not saved. He's writing to this church because of false teaching in this church that are that's battering and bruising this, these congregations and these Christians that is trying to pull something over their eyes and deceive them. Certainly in our day and time, and even in John's time, this book was used to awaken false converts. But the main purpose of this book was to give assurance to people who have been affected by false teaching, trying to destroy them. And what we see today here in 1 John chapter 2, we'll be looking at beginning at least with verse 18, we see that John, in encouraging these Christian people, is going to help them see the day and time they actually live in. There's many Christians today. We, I talk a lot about false Christianity. I talk a lot about false churches. If I do not do that, I am unfaithful to God because there's so much of that today. The reality is this, though. There are, and we know this, and some of you know this intimately, there are true churches, there are true Christians, they are hurting, they are suffering, and the reason is because there's so many false teachers running around spreading their lies. I'm thinking of one person right now, some years ago, was in a great distress of soul, troubled in her Christianity. Why was that for It was because she had been fed the lies that if only she had the faith and only she prayed enough, her loved one with cancer would have been healed and the fact that this person wasn't, it was her fault. You ever gone through something like that before? When the false teachers blame you because someone else is sick? When the false teachers come to you and they try to ravish the church, take a, take advantage of the church, take advantage of the people. Well, this is not anything new. How many of you have heard of deconstructionism? That word means different things today. One thing that means, though, you'll see this especially in people my age, um, younger and older, but my around my age range, you'll see people talk about deconstructing the faith. Well, I I was born in a Christian home. I went to Sunday school. I was an evangelical. But you know what? I just began to doubt. I was at college and began to doubt things. I I began to look and I I found out that you know my sexuality was different than what the Bible teaches. And I know that my God wouldn't have done that to me. And before you know it, they either have a different brand of Christianity or they're done with Christianity altogether. That's a very popular thing that you see, this deconstruction, this bringing down things. Well, there's nothing new today, my friends. John is writing to people bombarded by false teaching. He is writing to people who have begun to doubt themselves, not in some modern way that we have to have self-esteem. They are beginning to actually doubt the faith itself or to be tempted to doubt the faith itself. We are, we've been talking a lot about personally knowing that we are Christians. We need that, but this epistle, and you see something of it here in these verses that we're going to look at, these verses as well talk about knowing that the faith, the whole Christianity is true. Because when you have intelligent, persuasive, even leaders of the church leaving churches, you see that, don't you? How many pastors have you seen It may be a small amount, truly, compared to all the churches that we may have in our country. But how many pastors have you seen just in the last couple years who have fallen and gone into some sin or they have led the church a different direction? These wolves come into churches, they they fleece the sheep, they get what they can, and the Christians are left wondering, is what we really believed and grew up with, is that really what God has said? This is what's happening here. Nothing has changed. These Christians are in a crisis of faith. They're being tempted. And this is what John says to them. He says, know the times. Know the times. Let's look in verse 18. He says, know the times. You want to be helped today? 
know the times. You want to look around and see why there are uh, a number of churches and pastors and Christians maybe you know personally who have left the church, not left a church to go to another Bible-believing church, but just simply left the church, and guess what? They, they appear to be happy now. And you say, what's going on here? And here's what the Bible says. The Bible says, know the times. Verse 18, children. John is saying children, first of all, he's a very... He's an aged man. He may be in his 90s when he wrote this, but he's saying children because he's a spiritual father. He's an apostle. He's speaking to his children. And it may even be that he's saying children here because children are can be easily led astray. And though these Christians, as we may see today, have an anointing, they they have the Spirit of God, they are not led astray. Still, any of us for a time at least are in danger of being led astray. And John says to these Christians, children, It is the last hour. Now what does that mean, it's the last hour? He doesn't say the last days, but he might as well have said the last days, the last times. What does he mean by that? Often when people talk about the last days, the last times, what they mean is a time, maybe a couple years or a few decades before Jesus comes. He's coming right now. And, and you know, there's many different prophecies that are made and different preachers say this and that. And they want to point out who the Antichrist may be and this. And they say the last days is, you know, the last decade before Jesus comes. Well, John here is instructing us in something that's really clear in the Bible He's instructing us to understand that not only today, but even in John's day, the last days had come upon us. The last hour in the Bible is the time of Jesus' coming, death, resurrection. It's the time between that and His second coming. No matter how many years that may be in the Bible, the last days is that era between the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ. That's the last days. Look with me just, or listen or look with me maybe just a couple places. Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost. What does Peter say? He quotes a prophecy from, from Joe. He says in verse 15, For these men are not drunk as you suppose, for it is only the third hour of the day. They were speaking in tongues. They were empowered by the Spirit. But this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel and it shall be in the last days. Peter says at the day of Pentecost, the church was in the last days already. And today we are still in the last days or the last hour. James chapter 5, verse 30. Verse 3. James chapter 5, verse 3. This is what James says. James is one of the earliest New Testament books written, most likely. He says, Your gold and your silver have rusted, and their rust will be a witness against you, and will consume your flesh like fire. He's not saying it's wrong to have wealth. He's saying it's wrong to have wealth and not use it for God, not use it rightly. Your gold and your silver silver have rusted and their rust will be a witness against you and will consume your flesh like fire. It is in the last days that you have stored up your treasure. He says it's the last days and you're storing up treasure in the last days? That's back in the first century. And then 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 For He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, speaking of Jesus, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you. So when you think about last days, when you think about last hour, last time, and there's many other places in the New Testament that bring this out, you're not looking at the last ten years before Jesus comes. If that's true, the New Testament's wrong then. But that's not what the authors of the New Testament meant. When they spoke of last hour, last days, they were speaking this last time frame when Jesus has come between that first coming and this second coming. This is the last days. Now you may say it's kind of strange. 2,000 years seems like a long day. 
Well, a thousand years is like a day to the Lord, and a day is like a thousand years to the Lord. But when you look at the bigger picture of God's plans, how many thousand years were in the Old Testament, and even spiritual realm, the the making of angels and so forth, the Bible says right now, no matter how short our time may be before Christ comes back, no matter how many more years or even centuries there may be before Christ comes back, we are in the last days right now, just like John was in the last days. He says, know this. And look what he says next. Children, it is the last hour, and just as you heard... So they have been taught about the end times. And just as you heard that Antichrist is coming. So they had been taught that the Antichrist, and I believe there's one man who is coming at some point, Antichrist, the Antichrist, that he is coming. They've been taught about that. Let me turn to one passage here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, 4, and 8 speak about the Antichrist. Now, it doesn't use the term Antichrist here, but it speaks about the man of lawlessness. It speaks about the son of destruction. I take those people to be ex- the same people that he's speaking of and that John's speaking of in John 2. But Paul here in 2 Thessalonians, the context here is the Thessalonians, Paul had talked about the second coming of Christ in 1 Thessalonians, and then perhaps somebody had masqueraded themselves as as an apostle or sent a letter to the Thessalonian church acting like it was from the apostle Paul, and they were teaching that the second coming of Christ had already come. And here's the Christians... You know, it's some years, it's not that long, but it's some years after Christ has been taken up to heaven, and they're being told they've missed out already. They're they're being told and taught by false teachers that Christ has come to earth, He's come back, and they're too late. They missed out. And here's what Paul says, Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first. That's very important for what we will probably be looking at later today. The apostasy. The falling away. For it will not come unless the apostasy comes first. And the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. There has been many people, including Roman emperors, who wanted to be called Lord and God. Domitian was one of them, probably at the time of John's writing of 1 John. There have been many people, not just in Rome, but even in our day in different countries, who thought themselves as God, dictators who exalted themselves up as God was, and demanded people to worship them and adore them. Well, at some time, this man of lawlessness, this Antichrist, is coming. And he's going to do this. Apparently like, apparently like no one else has ever done before. But verse 8 says this, Then that lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will slay with the breath of His mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of His coming. Now what does this all have to do? As we turn back to 1 John, what does all this have to do with not only us, but we always begin with the Bible before we get to us, what does this have to do with John's readers, and those he's writing to. John says, we're at the last days. You have heard that Antichrist is coming. He hasn't come yet in John's day. And this is what John wants us to see. The Antichrist may not have come, John says in verse 18, but many Antichrists have come. Many. Not if you want to put it this way, capital A Antichrist, but many smaller case A Antichrists have come. And he says because because now we have such 
opposition to Christ, now that we have people not only saying they are Christ, but denying Christ, if you look down in verse 22, it says, Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, the one that denies who Jesus is. How many people? Do that today and have done that for centuries and centuries. There's ebbs and flows, but still, antichrists are here with us and they are thriving, if you, if we can use that kind of language for them. They are thriving. And John says, and we'll get to why this is important in a moment, but John says, you know that we are in the end days why the antichrist may not be here yet, but antichrists, many of them. Look what he says again. Even now, Many, not few. You know, in the Bible, when you read about the evil people, oftentimes it says many, doesn't it? When you read about the godly people, it's few, right? That's the way life is. Few will be saved. Few will find the narrow way. But they're making fun of me. They're calling me a holier than thou. Well, that's, that's a good sign at least. That's a good sign that someone's calling you that because at least you look different than the world. Well, someone's making fun of me because I don't go to places like they used to go and I just, they just, they're, I'm losing friends. That's a good sign. Now, don't lose friends for bad reasons. But it's a good sign that the world rejects you. It's a good sign the world doesn't, isn't really interested in our worship this morning. It's a good sign that the world isn't really interested so much in, in you anymore because you're so different than them. That's a good sign. That may very well be because you're rejecting these antichrists who have appeared. Look in chapter 4 of 1 John. Chapter 4, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the Spirit of the Antichrist of which you have heard that is coming and now is already in the world. Look back in verse 1, about halfway through, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. That's probably around the year A.D. 90. That's a long time ago. And John is saying even then, many false prophets have arisen already and they're going out. Let me read, look with me in Matthew 24, if you will. We'll look at one passage here about antichrists before we go on. This is nothing new that John is teaching his readers, but just like us, we all need to be reminded of these things. Um, if, If our view of of like going to church service or hearing preaching or even preaching in and of itself, like me preaching. If it's something as if every time I preach, I want to say something new, well, I'm going to be missing out on a lot of things because the Bible wants to remind us of things over and over and over. Peter himself said in one of his letters, I'm writing to you to remind you of these things. You know these things. I want to remind you. John's listeners had been taught this, and yet John is helping them again. It's like a man who's drowning. Uh, A man who's drowning, he's able to swim, but he's panicked. He forgets he can swim in the same way John's readers are being tempted and sometime in the heat of battle, we forget the things we ought to know by heart. We just forget them and we need someone to come along and put their hand on our shoulder and say, brother, sister, don't you remember what our Lord said? Remember this. We need that. Well, here's what Jesus said in, in Matthew 24. And, and, and this passage is, is interpreted in different ways, but this most certainly, though, will help us and apply what we are seeing here. In verse 23, Then if anyone says to you, Behold, here is the Christ, or there He is, 
do not believe him. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Behold, I have told you in advance. He says, listen, I'm leaving you. There's going to be people coming, false Christ. They're going to say that I'm Christ. They're going to be coming. They're going to be showing signs and wonders to mislead many people. And John says that's the day that we live in right now. There's ebbs and flows. But in the first century, the last days had come upon us. And now in our century, the last days have come upon us. And the last days or the last hour will be upon us until Christ comes back. We're in the last days. You don't have to, to look at a prophetic um, demonstration, a prophetic outline to see when the last days are coming. We are there already, the Bible teaches us. And now I want you to look in verse 19. John says you've got to know the times if you want to be helped with the things you're struggling with. He says we're in the last days. You know you're in the last days because of all these antichrists who have appeared. And he says this in verse 19. They went out from us. What's one of the things that's really bothering this church? It's all the people who have left them. And John begins by saying, know the times, know the times and the seasons, know that the last days are upon us, know that false teachers are upon us, know all these things. So when you see all the apostasy, when you see all the falling away happening, when you see pastors fall away from your congregations, when you see men and women who you once thought were strong Christians going off to Gnosticism, going off into these other heresies, when you see these things, know that's what happens in the last days. And John is saying to his Christians he's writing to, listen, when you see apostasy happen, know that that's a sign of the times. Don't think Christianity has failed because a well-known pastor falls, falls into sin and heresy and false teaching. Don't think Christianity has failed. Just know this, that's the days we live in. We're in the last days. When you see a fairly large exodus of churches. I mean, it's half, and I don't say this, I'm not saying this to hurt anybody, but it's probably half of the Methodist churches or so in our country right now. When you see, and it's not just them, trust me, the Episcopalian and other Baptist churches, when you see churches saying that homosexuality, lesbianism, all these things are normal, not only are they tolerated, but they are good and wholesome. When you begin to see these things in churches, in pulpits, and in pastors, and in seminaries, know this, it's not that Christianity has failed you, it's that we're in the last days. And that's what happens in the last days. In one sense, it's like John Wesley said. John Wesley, though I would, I would think Christianity has been more successful than, than he said at this time. He said one reason that Christianity has, has done so little in the world is because it's so little known. That's true. Why is Christianity maybe not thriving in our country? One reason is simply it, true Christianity has not been preached. True Christianity has not been spread in churches and seminaries. Oftentimes, that's one reason. But another reason is this. It's the last days. It's the end times. And that's what happens. Apostasy happens. So when you see it, don't think Christianity has failed you. Just know what day we live in. We live in the last days. We live in the end times. We live in the days that Peppa Pig introduces a lesbian couple last week. That's not in the church. That's going to be celebrated by people in the church. We live in the last days. This is the end times. And John writes about it. Look in 1 Peter chapter 4. Or 1 Timothy chapter 4.
While you're turning there, let me just stress again, what we're looking at this morning is not a good Christian leaving a Bible church and going to another Bible church. That's not what John's looking at. When he talks about people leaving them, he's saying they are leaving us not to go to another church that's similar to us, that teaches similar things. He's saying they are leaving us because they no longer think we have the truth. They're committing apostasy in some sense at least. They are falling away. He says they are leaving us not because... Um, they just, they're closer to this local congregation over here and they preach the Bible and they think they can do ministry better over there. That's not what John is saying. John is saying they're leaving us because they think they found something better than Christianity. They're going out and not only are they going out, they're now coming back into our congregation in some way and trying to influence the people and bring other people with them. That's what John is saying. These false teachers, it's not enough for them to, to hightail it out of town. They want to hightail it out of town of some of their church members they used to belong with and teach them these corrupt false doctrines as well. That's what John is looking at. And in 1 Timothy chapter 4, the Bible just makes it so clear, but the Spirit explicitly says that in later, time, later times, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. Behind every false teacher, as it's been said, is a spirit. It's either the Holy Spirit or it's the spirit of the devil. We are in a spiritual battle here. We do not wage war of flesh and blood. We do not wrestle with just simply things we can touch. We live in a spiritual realm. There is spiritual reality and there are evil spirits empowering people to persuasively and nicely spread falsehoods among God's people. But the Spirit explicitly says that in later times, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. Who are these men and women? By means of the hypocrisy of liars seared in their own consciences. You say, how can that false teacher go around and say these foolish things? Some of you have seen it on YouTube, haven't you? Some of you may have been unfortunate enough to be in the presence of such people like that. How can anyone believe and say such outlandish things? Well, one thing is they're greedy for money. If you keep paying, they'll keep saying. But another thing is right here, their own conscience has been seared with a branding iron. They no longer feel, they no longer... It, it's. I remember hearing someone, he was talking about speaking to Jehovah's Witnesses, and he talked about it's like their eyes are glazed over. Now that's not everyone in that cult. But when you get in the false teaching, it's almost like the switch has been turned off and it's over. You don't hear anything, you don't think anymore. Your eyes are glazed over. You're just shaking your head that way and this way. It's just, you have been taken, your conscience has been done with, you're through, you're like some kind of puppet of the false teachers now. By, by means of the hypocrisy of liars seared in their own conscience, of as with a branding iron, and listen, these are some of the false teachers they were facing at the time, the teachings. Men who forbid marriage. That's Roman Catholic Church, isn't it? For the priests. We've talked about that on Wednesday night. They forbid marriage. The Bible says not everyone has to get married, but the Bible says that when you do get married, that's a good thing. And we talked about intimacy and all that. That's part of the marriage. We talked about that from 1 Corinthians 7. But marriage is a good thing. What's the false teachers going to say? They're saying, no, no, you can't get married. That's sinful. And advocates abstaining from foods which God has created to be gratefully shared in by those who believe and know the truth. I'm not saying that every person in our area who say it's wrong to eat pork falls into this category, but no doubt some of them do. I've talked to them. It's not a large segment, but it's a, it's a small segment in our area that say it's sinful to eat pork. Listen, if your conscience tells you 
That you can't eat pork, that's fine. Keep that to yourself, that's fine. Obey your conscience. But when you start telling other people that they're sinning because they're not keeping dietary laws, you've crossed the line in the false teaching. That's what's going on here. And John is saying, when you see these people fall from the church, you, you, you're starting to doubt yourself. You're starting to say, is Christianity true? All these good people are leaving us. They're going to these other religions. They're going to these cults. Is what I have really true? John says to these Christians, listen, it's the end times. This is Antichrist expected. Expected. We have a fairly good size congregation this morning for us right now. I don't want anybody to be lost. But it would not be surprising that on that day, there's some here who are lost. It wouldn't surprise me. Simply because of the numbers. Simply because of the numbers. As for us to look into our hearts, look into God's Word, to make sure we are not deceived by Antichrist. But look what he says, and we're back in 1 John. Look in verse 19 again. Now, I believe the Bible elsewhere speaks of an apostasy, a true Christian committing apostasy, though I don't think that's normal. I think that's possible. That's not what John is looking at here. He's looking at false conversions and false converts leaving the church. That's what he's looking at here. And look what he says. Why are all these people live, leaving the church? Well, it's the end times. That's true. Antichrists are here. Yes. False teachers are here. Yes. Look what he says now in verse 19. They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. That word remained there is from at least the same root word as abide is. As we go down, we won't go down today, but as you go down in this passage, maybe you read it when you get home, you see the word abide, 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 used over and over and over. Same root word right here. They did not abide with them. For if they had been of us, they would have remained or abided with us. But they went out so that it would be shown that they all are not of us. Why did these false teachers, these antichrists, leave the church in John's context? It's because they were never really part of us to begin with. They were never saved. He says, if these false teachers, if these antichrists, if they would have been part of us, they would have remained with us right now. But they're gone. You know, on one level, obviously it can be heartbreaking to see this happen. See a family member reject Christianity. To see a family member go to a cult religion. To see a, a, a family member go to a progressive church. It can be heartbreaking to see these things. And it's heartbreaking for these people to see true, what they thought at least were true Christians, leave the faith, go elsewhere, and now they're teaching a false doctrine. It's heartbreaking. It should also be, though, helpful. Look what John says at the end of verse 19. From this, but they went out so that it would be shown or manifested that they were, that they all are not of us. Now it's heartbreaking. We want everyone saved. And we, if someone leaves that, that, that we don't know what God is going to do in their life, we pray, we witness, we want them to come back and repent. Yes, to all that. Even false teachers can be converted and saved. But the point I want to draw out right here is this. When the false teacher leaves and he makes himself known, that's a good thing for the church. Because he's no longer acting like he's part of the church anymore. He's no longer being deceptive within the church anymore. He has been made known what his real colors are and now we can warn people about him. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 11. I 
I've said this recently, I think it was on a Wednesday night, but in one sense there's too much division in the church, and in another sense there's not enough division in the church. And when I say church, I just mean generically speaking, the American church, let's say. There's not, there's too much division because we're too divided on little things that don't matter. Just so many things just don't matter. I mean, people are going to heaven or hell and churches are splitting because of, uh, you know, the, the water fountain hasn't worked in three weeks. Ours is working, by the way. But the water fountain hasn't worked in three weeks. My needs aren't met. You know, some ridiculous things like that. You know, you know how it is, don't you? Why is one the reason in some areas there's a church on every corner? It's because there's a person in every corner who can get along with the other person in every corner. So they just decide to make their own church building. We're too divided on things like that, and yet we're not divided enough on the things that really matter. The gospel, truth, holiness. The Bible instructs us on these things. But look what happens here in the Corinthian church. This is a church, as we've seen, they're divided, they have these different divisions. Paul's saying, I don't want no divisions in the church. You need to stop this. Reconcile. Bring it together. Our focus is on Christ. We are, we are nothing. He is everything. There's no reason for divisions. Be humble and love one another. Here's what he says in verse 18 and 19. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that divisions exist among you, and in part I believe it. For there must also... Look what he says. He doesn't say stop divisions here. He says it in another place. But he says there must also... There must... It must happen like this. For there must also be factions, divisions among you. So that those who are approved, approved by whom? God and the church, we may say as well. So that those who are approved may become evident among you. You see, sometimes division, though many times it's bad, we don't want division, of course. Sometimes division is necessary because it's God separating early the sheep from the goats and letting the sheep see who the goats are so the sheep can see they are the sheep, they are approved of God, and these goats over here, they're not. And we're going to let everybody know that here before the final judgment. Sometimes division, sometimes when you see uh, a people, maybe a religious leader, showing his real colors, though we should mourn over anyone who would defect, from a position of authority and leadership. But in another sense, when you see a leader defecting like that, on one level we ought to say, whew, I'm glad it happened now rather than later. Because at least we know who he is now. And we can warn people about him. Here in 1 John, there's people leaving. There's people going from the church. The church is wondering, do we have the truth? Do we really know we have these people we once looked up to? They're now teaching something different. John, do we really have the truth? And John says to them, know the times. Know that antichrists are here. Know that apostasies have happened. Know that when people leave you in this context, when people leave you, know this, they were not part of you. They're showing, they're manifesting their true self. So be, be in one sense, be encouraged by that. God is taking the false teachers away from the true churches. Then let me just touch on this. What about them though? How do we know that we're not going to be drawn off? Well, there's a lot of things to say, but look what John says in verse 20 and 21. But you have an anointing from the Holy One. You ever listen to a preacher preach, or you, you read a Christian book, or you watch some kind of thing on television, or you went to a special church service somewhere, and you couldn't put your finger on it? But you just knew something's not right here. Now we need to judge everything by Scripture. What we feel can be wrong, certainly. But you just say, something's not right here. I, I, maybe you, it's when you were a new Christian and, and you're listening to somebody teach and preach and you're, you know, I, I don't know much about the Bible, but I, I know what that person's saying. 
That's just not right. That's something of what John's saying here. He's saying these false teachers went out because they never were of you. Why are they not abiding with you? It's because they never had the anointing. The Spirit of God never came within them. The Word of God never came within them. They never truly belonged. But you have an anointing from the Holy One and you all know I have not written to you because you do not know the truth. He says, listen, remember, I'm not writing because you don't know the truth. But because you do know it. And because no lie is of the truth. I'm writing to you because you know what the truth is, friend. I'm writing to you because you do live a holy life. I'm writing to you because you are seeking after the things of God. And these false teachers who are tempting you, they went out because they never were of you. They're false and they still are false. Don't follow them. And for us, the year 2022, we see defections happening. And I'm not, I'm not primarily right now talking about our society or culture or anything. I'm talking about the churches. We see people falling away. We see churches giving over. We see this happening more and more. And what John would say to you is don't be shaken when those who are false show themselves. Because that's bound to happen because we live in the last days. You hold on to what you have heard from the beginning, John says. You hold on to what you have heard and not let go of it. I want to turn one more place. John 6, 